Good morning and welcome to the Mindful Messenger Show brought to you by the Liberty Beacon Media Project. My name is Amanda Johnson and today we are talking to Renee Fry about mindful job searching. Renee Fry, the president of Talent Q Inc. and author of I Hate Mondays, a guide to landing a job that makes you jump out of bed, has over 16 years of recruiting experience in a search firm and Fortune 30 company. With a love for people, natural knack for conversation, and energy that can blow the roof off of any room, it makes sense that Renee Fry ended up in the recruiting industry. Ready to bring a fresh approach to the recruiting industry, Renee started Talent Q, a nationwide recruiting firm headquartered in Hudson, Wisconsin. As a recruiting expert, speaker, and author, Renee clears the noise in hiring, making the recruiting process a positive experience for both candidates and clients, always putting the people first. Talent Q is proud to be certified as a woman-owned business and takes pride in providing supplier diversity to the incredible companies they partner with. Welcome, Renee. Thank you. So I'm so excited happy to have you here. Me too. Yeah, this is good. I, um, I loved working on your book. It was so fun. I loved um, the entire process of it, and I'm, I, I hope you're as proud of it as I am because I think that it makes – this whole crazy business of finding a job a little bit easier. I know, um, I don't know how many times I've referred people to the book already since we, <laughs> since we finished it. I'm like, right. no, but she does. Go read this book. Contact her for coaching. So um, I'm excited to have you here. And, and I, I do want to talk about all of your amazing uh, tricks and tools for helping people make the job search easier. But I'd also love to hear a little bit about why a book? As a, as a headhunter, why a book? Like, yeah. Did you decide yeah. That? So Amanda, thank you so much. And I couldn't have finished the book without your help. So kudos to you. It was fun. Um, well, before I started Talent Q, I worked at Target Corporation and I recruited for all of their 14 headquarter pyramids. So HR, legal finance, all of them, merchandising, and then their stores leadership in the field, as well as distribution leadership roles in the field. And due to that network at Target that I had, when I started my company, I was inundated by hundreds of people that still were at Target that wanted to get out of Target and needed help finding a new job. And strategically, at that time, I didn't have the resources to talk to each and every one of them. And so I was on an airplane to a conference in Las Vegas, and all of a sudden I realized, oh my gosh, if I could write a book, that would be a resource to help all of these people. And then I could still be helping people while, you know, they were on their career journey, but I wouldn't have to talk, take the time to talk to each and every one of them. So the book actually started coming to me on the airplane and I was feverishly typing it into my notes on my iPhone. Nice. <laughs> it's funny how we get into those spaces. I know our mutual friend Ursula does some of her best writing on the plane. Like she yeah. loves... She loves to travel when she's writing a book because it, <laughs> right. right? Yeah. Okay. So that's, and that's something that I hear a lot from messengers who, you know, were like, okay, I hear myself saying the same thing over and over and over and over again. I'm kind of tired of saying it all the time. And also if I have to say this a million times, then how many people can I actually help? Right. Exactly. So, and I love that because the, the book kind of gives a way for you to um, help people at a certain level. And then they come to you with all of this, like, this is what I'm thinking based on all of these amazing insights and, and um, tools that you gave them. And then you just have to do the subtle tweaking, right? Like, right. Exactly. It's not one of those, it's not one of those horrendous um, resumes that we saw in the book. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> I spent so much time on. Okay. So you're on a plane and you have this idea come through and you're typing on your iPhone, which I love. Um, and then what, like what were some of the, how did the writing process go for you and, and what were some of the challenges that you found? Yeah. So first I was just getting it all on, getting it all out of my head and then when I realized, okay, I actually want to try to write a book or I want to write a book, then I realized I had to get an outline formulated. And that's when I started actually formulating the structure of the book. And then I think at that time, that's when I was introduced to you. And, and then when you and I put together in that structure for you would give me deadlines and then I would have to have the content completed by a certain deadline. And then that really propelled me to 
see the book happening and to know that I could actually do this and finish and have an actual published book. Yeah. So it was just getting all the content out that was on my mind and then formulating that outline structure. And then I know you reviewed my outline structure and then you had the great idea of the candidate story, which makes the book entire, entirely palatable because otherwise a book on job searching would be so boring. But that candidate story is what allows people to get engaged and actually read it. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. And also to feel like, all of the emotions that they're having through the process, all the little bit of fear coming up or the hesitation or the confusion, like it kind of makes all of that normal, acceptable, okay, so right. they can kind of just get past it and do what the candidate is doing in the story. You know? Exactly. Get exactly. it done. Yeah. Yep. And then they know they're not alone. Like it's normal to have mm -hmm. those emotions. Yeah. Definitely. And, and so for you, I know that you have, you have little ones at home, right? I do. I have a six and eight year old daughter, daughters. So, so how does, how does a female entrepreneur mother make time in her schedule to actually get a book done? Yeah, you have to schedule the time. Um, so I am a master of being really strategic about my time. As a business owner, I only have a certain number of hours in the day. And I learned early on with my company that I needed to delegate as fast as possible. So I rely on people, my team to do the work that they need to do. And so I'm very quick to delegate. And then I structure my time um, to get my tasks done to accomplish my goals. So for the book, I specifically had to schedule in time where that's all I was working on. And I had my clothes, my door closed. I wasn't taking any phone calls. And in my profession, there's no fires. Like we're not saving lives. So right. <laughs> things can wait. And just being able to prioritize and be really focused is what helped me get through the book process. And then along with your help with having those set dates when you and I connected and I had deadlines, that was critical for me in completing yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what was the space that you wrote in? What did you, did you do it at home? Did you do it at the office? It was in the office most of the time, except for on the weekends when sometimes I didn't commit to the time, which happened maybe 10% of the time. And then I was at home taking care of it um, at night or on the weekend. But for the majority of the time, I was able to get it done in that slotted time because there's times when you have to be I feel when I was writing I had to be in the right mindset to be able to focus solely on the content that I was rereading over and over again and sometimes you needed to be in a different space to allow to feel more creative and to have a different lens than my formal office space yeah yeah and what's interesting is like for me it's really hard for me to write my content and my book sitting at my desk because when I'm at my desk, 90% of the time I'm working on other people's content. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I can't, I can't work here. I have to go either. My first book I had to write in, I was in the same office, but I had another chair in there. And so I could write in that chair at the office, but yeah, um, yeah it makes it really hard. I think this next one I'm going to have to do um, I'd love to take myself on a retreat, but I think I'm going to pull up at a coffee oh, shop. Oh, that would be awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It makes it a lot easier when you have that time devoted and, and it's good too, when you have the people around you. So how did you, um, how did you structure that whole, cause I remember the process of getting feedback and going through that whole piece that was really important to you because you had, um, I believe like an old mentor that you really wanted their feedback on it and yeah. other people. So how did you, how did you choose those people and how did you experience that process? Cause it's a little, it's nerve wracking for most of my authors, you know, to start to share their content with other people for the first time. Yeah, I actually, so I'm not, obviously we all have egos, but as a business owner and through all the personal coaching and growth mindset stuff I've done, I really don't have, I don't let my ego inhibit me. And so I really welcomed the feedback that I was going to receive um, because I wanted to make sure it was going to deliver the right message to the audience that was going to be utilizing it. And so the people that I selected were um, at different levels in their career. 
people that were phenomenal, like standout individuals um, that I had placed. So I had a bucket of those individuals that I reached out to. And then my um, old coach at the time, I reached out to him and he, it's funny because with him, I struggled. I kept re um, reminding him like, Hey, we have this deadline. And then we actually had to print the entire thing for him and mail it to him. And then he got back to me with the feedback. So <laughs> I'm glad we realized that. And then I did get his feedback. And then I had um, a ton of people in my immediate circle read it as well. Um, and I did get some really valuable feedback, but it was important to me to select people that were going to give me honest feedback. Mm -hmm. And I'm in the Midwest and there's a lot of people in the Midwest that are, that can be kind of passive aggressive and that aren't really direct with feedback. Mm -hmm. And so I knew it was critical to find the right people that were going to give me honest feedback because that's what I was looking for to modify the content and change what needed to be changed. Yeah. So what kind of feedback did you get? How, how was that process for you? Were they, was it helpful? Did they help you find? Yeah, I thought it was really helpful. So it was interesting because I told them to give me feedback on the content and if there's anything like grammar or whatever. And so there were, um, one of the gals that responded back, she said, I would change this a little bit. She had some areas where she would, where she wanted me to add some content, which was helpful. Um, yeah, so the feedback was really good and I took everyone's feedback to heart and changed and modified it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's really, I can't, I can't tell people enough, like how important it is to get that level of feedback because it does, it gives you, it gives you such a good feeling of like, okay, now the book is going to do what I want it to do. You know, that exactly. true to intention, like there's nothing exactly. and to have different sets of eyes on it. You know, people who have been in the industry, people who have been supported by the industry, like it's really, it, it does, it gives you kind of that 360 view, mm -hmm. as, which is needed after you spend as much time as you do reading and reading. Oh, totally. And just knowing that it's not like, it's not stat. I mean, it's constantly evolving. I can add content and modify, have a new version. So it's like, I just wanted to do that initial round and then modify it and then get it out there. And then we can continue to evolve it in the future. So mm -hmm. Yeah. So how has it helped you with the business since you launched it? It's been yeah, about a year, right? I would say, you know, it's been good. Um, we've gotten a ton of great reviews and people, someone called it magic. Um, mm -hmm. Ironically, one gal that I had worked with at Target for years, she was in HR and she's like, Renee, I've been a recruiter and I read your book and I learned stuff that I didn't even know. I was like, oh my gosh, this is perfect, right? <laughs> Um, and she awesome. was able to get a job in two weeks. I had another individual comment that she got a job in two weeks from following the steps and stuff. So I love hearing those success stories. So that makes me feel really good that it is helping people and, um, they're doing it on their own time, you know? So if they want more in depth, um, coaching, then obviously I can step in, but I'm glad that it's a resource for people and it's helping people. So they love their Mondays instead of hate them. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Cause that was a really fun part of our process. And you're like, I don't know about the title of the book. I know. I remember that totally. I tell people this all the time. So you and I, you really probed me. You were like, okay, we're going to figure out the title today. And I remember all of a sudden you started asking me about target. And I said, yeah, there's this joke actually where I would tell everyone I'm going to wear a shirt that says, I hate Mondays under my blazer and I'm going to flash people. And you're like, that's the title. And I'm like, what? And you're like, I hate Mondays. And so from, I don't know what prompted you to start asking me specific questions, but through your questioning, then out came this story that I had shared and the title was right there. So that was like incredible. <laughs> yeah. And it makes it really fun. I mean, you know, the, the, the title is always supposed to speak to the heart, right? And so, of course, the heart of the people looking for jobs or for a new job is, oh yeah, <laughs> my job, right? Like, I hate Mondays. Yep. And it speaks to. I mean, that title speaks to people. I had one individual who I know, and she was at, she was in tears, and I gave her, I handed her the book, and she's like, "That's exactly how I feel. I just have so much anxiety." And it was like one o'clock on Sunday. I'm like, "Time out." 
I'm like, there's plenty of weekend left. Forget about Monday. Like, let's focus on Sunday. <laughs> yeah. So it's crazy how people really do feel that way. And mm-hmm. they have those Sunday night blues and are really anxious about going back to work because they hate their jobs, which is so horrible. I want everyone to love their jobs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's possible, you know, it's possible to find yourself in a spot where it works. So let's talk about that a little bit. Like what are some of your best tips for people who are on the job search? Like some of the, what are some of the parts of the book that you hear feedback from all the time? Like I hadn't thought about this or. Yeah, I would say, um, how to reignite your network and network with people and ask them for help when you're looking for a job, because the number one way to find a job is through your own personal network. And a lot of people get really intimidated. They're like, Oh my gosh, well, I've worked at ABC company for 10 years and I haven't reached, I haven't stayed in touch with those people I used to work with for the previous 10 years. And I'm just going to reach out to them and ask them to help me find a job. No, you're not going to do that. You're just going to reach out to them and say, gosh, you know what? You crossed my mind recently and I realized I've been really bad at staying in touch with you. I'd love to reconnect. And then once you get that conversation going, you can say, oh, you know what? I really admired you when we worked together here because you did X, Y, and Z. And I know you left that organization and you're doing awesome things. I'm curious. I'm kind of in that spot right now and I'm starting to look outside. What tips do you have for me? that type of stuff. So it's like, people are so scared of, well, I'm going to look shallow if I reach out or I haven't talked to that person in 10 years. So what? Everyone wants to help people. And if you just open that door again, they're totally going to be willing to help you. And you might be surprised that person might be like, Oh my gosh, we have the perfect job for you. You want to come work for me? (laughs) How often does that happen? (laughs) all the time. People, when you, well, and I tell people, I'm like, let everyone, you know, in your network that you're looking for a job, like send out the APB because your neighbor, your friend's neighbor might be the CFO at XYZ company and have the perfect job for you. We are so interconnected and it's just by getting it out there and then people will know and they'll start to, the opportunities will start to come to you. Now I say, don't sit on the back burner and wait, be aggressive and reach out to people and have them get your contact information and resume in front of the appropriate people at their company. However, you have to be proactive, but also let everyone know because every, everyone wants to hire great people and birds of a feather flock together. So if you know somebody chances are they're going to vouch for you. And then if, if I'm a business owner and I need to hire a candidate and I have two jobs and one I've heard from Bobby that this candidate Jane is phenomenal because I used to work with her versus someone who just applied. This one already is higher in my mind. Mm -hmm. So it really does work. Yeah. So when you're talking about networks, what are the, what are some of the places that people should be looking at for networks? So you said neighbor, Maybe someone that you worked with in the past. Yeah, neighbor, people you've worked with in the past. LinkedIn is a huge portal because you can do a ton of research on there. Um, I would also say your alumni as groups from college, sorority groups, fraternity groups, um, church. You, there's communities at church, people you know at church. I say any group that you are a part of, um, you know, lean on those people because everyone wants to help people. Mm-hmm. I love that. I love how you say that. So like, of course, everyone wants to help people because I think that most people don't reach out because they feel like no one will want to help them. Like what right. is that, that we just have this feeling that where does that happen? Why do you think that is? I don't know. I think people fear, I think there's a fear element involved in it and nobody wants to be rejected. Mm-hmm. So if someone says, no, I can't help you. Okay, big deal. Move on to the next one. Or if someone, I mean, that chances are that's not going to happen. 99% of the people you reach out to are going to be like, oh my gosh, it's so great to hear from you, Amanda. I guarantee that's what's going to happen. Like, oh my gosh, I used to love working with you. Those are the things that's going to come out of it. Um, But I think there's this fear of, I don't know what to say first. And then um, how are they going to view me if I need help? Which is probably a fear of, just in an internal thought of what are they going to think of me, which I don't mind what people think. Um, so just 
you got to get yourself out there and you'd be surprised at what will open up for you and what will occur when you just ask people for help, because I guarantee they really want to help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. What else, what besides that at work, what are some of the other things that are like one of those pieces that people just, it doesn't occur to them while they're working towards finding a job? Practice interview, yeah. practice your interviewing skills. It is the person who interviews the best that gets the job, not the person with the ideal skill set. It is the person that interviews best gets the job. So practice. And what I recommend in the book is practicing with someone that intimidates you, who's going to give you honest feedback. Practice with people that um, maybe are your peers. And really think about, you have to be really thoughtful in your responses. And behavioral-based interviewing is such a hot topic or what the method that most companies utilize. And what they're looking for is what you did, uh, what the situation was, what you specifically did, and then the outcome. And when you can speak to that very in detail and then have data to support your outcome, it's you're going to stand out. Mm -hmm. And then another tip with interviewing is at the end, interviewing is just like dating. It's like, who's going to make the first move, right? The companies don't want to make the first move. But when you as the candidate say, I love what I'm hearing about ABC company and I want to come work for you. Is there anything about my background why I wouldn't be the best fit? Be bold, sell yourself, ask for the job. Because guess what? If you ask for the job and the other candidate doesn't, it's like dating. They know you want them. So they're most likely going to offer you the job because you showed the highest interest. Nice. So then let's go back to the interview part because I love this idea of practicing and the behavioral base. So can you give us an example of something like that happening where they, they ask, you know, what is the situation and how, how do most people respond in a situation like that? And then what are those small tweaks that they can make? Yeah. So like one question that we ask probably, you know, 80% of our, uh, the people that we interview to help them find jobs is tell me about a time when you successfully dealt with a conflict situation. So then what I would want to know in response is um, like very specific. So I would say there was a time when I was working with a peer in the recruiting department and um, she wanted to, she had a different approach for how we were going to go about sourcing candidates. And I um, had a disagreement with that. And so I would go into a lot of detail about that situation. And then I would say, and then what I specifically did was I invited her um, to a, you know, a 30 minute meeting and I put an itinerary in the calendar invite. And I basically was going at it at the angle of, I want to collaborate with you and get all of our ideas on the table so we can figure out strategically which one's best aligned to the individuals we're going to source so that we can be successful and find people quickly. Right. So then met with her, we watched through all this. I listened to all of her ideas. We had them all on the whiteboard. And then what we did was we circled the ones that we were in agreement on. And then we force ranked those. And then through that, we came up with the top three methods of sourcing that we were going to utilize. And then from there, we both tactically executed on that sourcing methodology. And at the end we sourced, you know, let's say 39 people in four weeks for that particular opportunity. So it was really successful. And then what I would always say at the end is what I learned from that was mm. you need to take the time to collaborate with people, listen to their ideas, and then um, in partnership with them, move forward when you're working on a project together. Nice. Sold. <laughs> all that, all that drama that they have in their office. They're like, Oh my God, we could mitigate all that. If we have right. Right. <laughs> I love it. Well, that's amazing. Okay. So networking, interviewing, anything else that people often miss? I know we had a lot of fun looking at the different parts of the resume, but that's really technical and people really should pick up the book just for that chapter. Yeah, it is very technical and it's so hard. Like I wish I could change resumes, but it's really hard to have a person and all their professional experience being evaluated in one or two pages. It's, you know, it's super frustrating from that regard, but it's this, that is what it is in our culture. 
Um, what else? Definitely huge proponent of following up. So sending thank you emails. You have to send thank you emails because again, candidate A sends a thank you and candidate B doesn't. This one's moving up in the um, process. Um, if you don't have their email address, ask for them, ask for business cards, um, and then make sure you follow up and do it via email. If you like to write handwritten thank yous, that's fine. You can do both, but you have to send the email, in my opinion, within 24 hours of your conversation. Yeah, to get there first, just in case the other ones are doing it too. Right, and make it be very thoughtful of something specific, genuinely why you want to work for that company. Yeah. Yeah. You know what um, occurs to me and I've, I've been completely guilty of this um, in the jobs, the few jobs that I interviewed for, because it is about network. All of the good jobs I had were this person said, I need this over here. Um, but it was the piece about doing research on the company. So for yeah. me, because it was usually networked, when I was going into a company that I didn't know about, like, I didn't know about them. <laughs> oh yeah, you have I didn't to know. Have anyone in my space saying maybe you should, you know, because it was all the the way that they pitched it was just kind of like loose and kind of unformed, and so that's how I went in. And I remember just scrambling trying to find the right answers because you know, it, oh yeah, eventually I had to ask them. So what is it because it's such a vast company i was like so what is it that you guys do <laughs> that was my way right and you don't want to ask that no, no, <laughs> you want to do your research for sure because nine majority of the company nine times out of ten the interviewer will ask you why do you want to work for us and so you better know what they do yeah. and why you want to work for them yeah what's the best way to get that information uh online i would say google the companies you can look at LinkedIn and see who works there. You might have a connection that works there right now. You could ping them and say, hey, why do you love working for that, for that organization? Glassdoor is a great resource. So glassdoor.com is anonymous platform where employees that work there can rate their companies. Now you have to take that as a grain of salt because some companies, um, you know, like one bad egg is gonna blast them maybe and give them zero stars. Um, so you got to take it as a grain of salt, but it's really beneficial to read through those. Um, and then I would say, go to the company website and I say, look at every single tab that the company has on there. You want to go thorough in depth and evaluate their website, check out them on Facebook. Um, you know, see if they have an Instagram page, Twitter, whatever, but definitely, um, if you Google them, all of that will come to the surface. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, good. Well, I, I think that um, what you're doing is amazing. So when people come to you, so now they have the book and then they come to you. So what kind of work are they doing with you now that you have this amazing resource for them? What's the, yeah. Support? Yeah. So individuals usually come to me for more in depth, like specific career coaching. So I do one hour, I do half hour and one hour career coaching sessions to help them navigate, um, like for example, one individual recently, she's about ready to get promoted to a senior director level. And she doesn't want that job because she doesn't want to stay at the company long term. However, I was able to help coach her through, okay, take the job because you will benefit from having the title. And then um, you'll appease everyone that want you, they're expecting you to take that role while you then look for another job external. And then we kind of formulated you know, what are the things that are most important to her? What really type of role is she going after? What's really important to her? What's not aligning with her current organization and getting her clear on her action plan? Like what are her values? And then now what is she going to do moving forward to get, find a new opportunity outside of that organization where she doesn't feel like, um, no longer aligns to her values. Mm -hmm. I love that piece about the values because, and the values and also, do you find that it's true? Because I haven't spent a, a lot of time in, I mean, I've been an, an entrepreneur for so long. Um, do you find that people have trouble getting to those answers on their own? Like they can say, I hate Mondays. It doesn't feel good, but they can't yeah. articulate why. 
Yeah. And so what I do in the coaching is I have them fill out a preliminary form. So I know exactly what they want to get clarity on. And then basically what I do is ask them specific questions targeted to getting them to answer the information that we need in those areas. So for sure, like the, um, people don't know. So once you start asking them questions, they're like, Oh my gosh, I do know what I want. I do know what I value. I do know what I want to do every day. I do know what my strengths are. And it's just asking the right questions to open that door for clarity for them. Really, that's all I do is I'm a great question asker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, and, and also like the time and space given to it, which I think right. is one of the gifts of the book, right? Because, you know, I, I did a workshop a few weeks back with some um, folks from Corporate America company up here. And it was hilarious because we, you know, we're doing all of this. I feel like it's really important story work about where, what's your story ceiling? You know, what's keeping you from that next project or that sure. next title or whatever. And um, at the end of the workshop, two hours, I asked them, what are you taking away? And so I'm expecting what I get in other places, which is I identified what the story is. I know the action plan next. And all of these people said, I'm really grateful that I got that I, that I gave myself two hours to think about my life and my career. Mm -hmm. Isn't that crazy? And I mean, for people like you and I who have to be in that mode all the time because we're <laughs> leading and driving and visioning and I had to fix my face because I was like, wow. I know it's shocking. Well, and I've been in corporate America for so long that I understand it. I can relate to it. And so I've been there, like I've been in their shoes. And so it's easy for me to ask the specific questions for them to then figure out, oh, to, they'll have the light bulb go off, right? Yeah. How did you make that shift for yourself? I mean, what was it that propelled you to, to, to make your move, to decide, like, I actually need to be doing this on my own? Oh, geez. So when I... So I used to, before I went to Target, I worked um, at different search firms for five years previously. And I always had, um, I was a top performer. And so they always wanted me to make more and more, bring in more and more revenue year after year. And I was like, no, I, I have everything I want. Like money isn't gonna bring me any more happiness. I wanna help more people. So then having a taste of that, and I actually led a team of um, executive recruiters. Then when I went to Target, Target, when I stepped in the door there, I was shocked. I mean, I felt kind of constrained by the politics and the corporate structure. And so I knew, I was like, uh, I am very innovative and have an entrepreneurial spirit and I want to do this on my own, but I did want to get that corporate experience so that I could bounce back out and ha set myself apart and my company apart for having that corporate experience. Because they typically say, headhunters go to corporate to die, they never bounce back out. They just stay mm -hmm. at, in internal corporate roles, whereas I didn't, I bounced back out and came back out to search. Um, and we're doing things differently here at Talent Q. So my team is gold on, I have minimum expectations and they, they each individually set their goals for what they wanna achieve. And then I manage them to those goals. So it's not going to consistently raise year after year if that's not what motivates them. And here we put people first. And in the previous firms I worked at, they always put revenue first, which I totally disagree with. And then here we're able to be the most comprehensive recruiting firm out there because I've written a book. I do career coaching on the side. Um, there's so much that we provide to the candidates and our clients that any other firm isn't doing. So. I knew there was a better way to do business. And that's really why I started Talent Q was because I'm passionate about helping as many people as I can get pay raises and promotions and helping companies find the top performing future employees to help drive them for their growth in their companies. Um, and so that's why I did this. Yeah. How do you do that as an entrepreneur? Because that is such a, an interesting, I mean, we, I think we all come to business that way of, you know, wanting to put people first and then there's like bills to pay and there are these moments, right? Where you have to be like, oh yeah, people first. So what do you, how do you put those, um, how do you keep yourself 
in that space. Obviously, it's something that's coming from the inside, but then there's all of the feedback from you know, the world and the coaches who are like, have you focused on your revenue lines and making your, um, your payroll every month? Like, what is that like for you? How, what are some of the things that you put in place to keep yourself there? Yeah, good question. Um, well, I've got, obviously I'm a data junkie, so we track all things data and we know that if we have this data activity, the revenue will come. Um, but really my philosophy and what I share with my team is when you put people first, the money will come. Everything will fall into line. We have to sleep at night and I am, I, there's no way I could be in this business for over 16 years if I didn't hold extremely high ethics. And that's one thing I will not waver on. We do not coerce candidates to take jobs. They can um, withdraw their candidacy at any time. We are there to support them along the way through the journey if we're working with them on a specific role at one of our clients. Um, because it's the end game that is the most rewarding, right? And so we have specific metrics in place. My team has metrics in place every week and they know if they're hitting these targets, everything will fall into line. We will hit our revenue targets and everything will be fine while maintaining the people first focus. Yeah. I mean, they all know people first. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, if you, if you think about it in the long run, you know, there's a, a, and at least in my industry, I watch some of the, some of the ways that it happens that people kind of get locked into the being focused on the, on the money instead of the people Mm -hmm. and what ends up happening to their brand as a result and what's happening to their business. Like they end up getting a bunch of candidates that they don't like working with, aren't a good fit and then get some results. And then this crap starts hitting the fan as far as what people are saying about them. Like, I love that you're talking about oh, yeah. that long, yeah, we, long game. We are very particular. So I, I'm a brand guru, worked at a brand company, Target, and Talent Q and Renee Fry, we are our own brands, right? And that is extremely important to me. So we choose who we do business with um, because we become an extension of those companies And those candidates, we become an extension of, we're representing them. And so at any time, my team feels empowered that if there isn't an alignment with values or expectations, we are happy to walk away. And we've done it numerous times. And we have no problem with that because we have to maintain our brand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's always about that long game. It's always about, you know... Oh, I love that. Thank you for sharing that part. I know it's a little off topic, but yeah, I no, love, that's fine. I, I love that. I think it's an important thing for our audience to know too. Like when they're looking for people to help them, obviously, you know, they need to contact you or someone like you. You know, when I'm, when I tell people about other book coaches or editors, like you, these are the things you should be asking. Like this is right. the type of person that you want to work with or the type of brand to make sure that you don't get you know, a long-term mess. <laughs> oh, exactly. Exactly. You want it your time. Yeah. You want to invest wisely and um, get an adequate return from that on the time of your investment, you know? So it is pivotal. Absolutely. Is there anything else that you want to share with our audience about the the process of job searching and, and what can make their lives easier? Um, well, if you, if they want to join, um, we send out three monthly publications. So if they wanted to join that, they can reach us um, and sign up for that at info at talentq.net. Um, we have, I push out a ton of content that we've gotten tremendous feedback on. So that goes out three times a month and people respond and they're like, oh my gosh, I was, that was so spot on and they even share it with their coworkers. So if they want to engage that way, um, we could do that. I've got my book that they can buy on Amazon yeah. or talentq.net. Um, but I've got all that information um, on info at talentq.net as a resource. Awesome. Awesome. So, so on your, on your own journey, what are some of the things, you know, cause this is all about mindful messaging and, mindful, just not just messaging, it's messengering, right? It's like yeah. business afterwards. So what are some of the things for you that kind of keep you 
in your center, focused on your vision and mission? Oh gosh, good question. Um, for me, we implemented the entrepreneur operating system, the EO system, EOS system in my company. And so I use a lot of their templates. So I have my one year, three year, five year plan. We have um, the rocks that we're working on. We do a level 10 meeting every Monday. And then that gives us what our actions are for that week. And then we've got more 90 day tasks to accomplish. Um, so that really keeps me grounded. Um, but as far as like um, messengers or resources that I turn to, um, a book that I read at least once a month is The Science of Getting Rich by Wallace Waddles. And that just always helps me realize that what I believe will come true. Mm -hmm. And so always making sure that I'm, and it's a super quick read, um, but that book for me, I've been reading once a month or if not more for at least a year. And it's been super helpful in keeping me focused because the book talks about you don't have comp you can't have a competitive mindset. There is no competition. So I believe there is no competition. There's one talent queue. There's one Renee Fry. Um, and there's plenty of business for all of us out there. Mm -hmm. And that book also goes back to people first where it says you must provide you provide more value than you take in monetary exchange. And I fully believe that. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some of the couple things that just, that I turn to and that I keep focused on. And it's been extremely helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I love that book. I'm actually part of a mastermind that reviews that book repeatedly. <laughs> oh, are you? Yeah. I love it. I've made, we've even, my husband and I've gotten together with other couples who've read it and my team has done it as a, monthly training event. Yeah. It's really powerful. Mm -hmm. And it's so simple and it's so obviously logical and like, of course, of course this right. is the way that it is. And now it's just right. the implementation part. That's, that's yeah. the thing. So would you say that, um, what was the first book that really changed your life? What was the, the first? Oh my gosh. So it was John Maxwell's intentional living, mm -hmm. which I read probably about three years ago. Um, I'm hyper type A individual. So I would race through the world. I would be the first to the door at Starbucks. It would um, hit you on the way in. And the book made me realize that <clears throat> I needed to slow down mm -hmm. and be intentional about everything I was doing. And so now I actually hold the door for people. I pay for people in line. Um, I have conversations with complete strangers. I smile and say hello if people are walking past me. Um, and that has changed my life because, and my marriage, because my husband at the time, let's see, it's, we've been married at that time. It was like 12 or 13 years. And my husband always commented and said, Renee, you are so selfish. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm extremely giving. Like, I'm like, I didn't understand what he was saying after I read this book. And I was in a group of gals reading the book. Or we would meet once a week. And through that discovery, <clears throat> I came home one day after work and I said, I need to talk to you, to my husband, Dustin. And he sat down and I said, I am so sorry. I've been so selfish for all these years. And he was like, oh my gosh. And we had this great discussion about it, but I couldn't believe that I finally had this awakening from reading this book and doing what it says to do that I realized I actually was being selfish in the relationship. And yet I had the, I now had the tools to change. And that's where it had changed my life because I, you have to forgive yourself for the past. So you forgive yourself and then you move forward and it's not perfection. It's progress. And as long as I'm taking steps to, grow and be better than I was the day before, then I'm fine and I can sleep at night. Mm -hmm. But that was really critical because I finally felt like, oh my gosh, I understood what you're seeing all these years. And that's just grown um, our relationship even further. So it's just that book mm -hmm. yeah. was incredible. Do you feel like you could look back at the book and also see its impact on your business? Oh, for sure. Because so much is involved in that. Like I look for people with growth mindset. Um, 
and it's, yeah, it's, and being intentional about, so then after that book as well, I looked at my entire calendar of where I was spending my time at networking events and where, what groups I was a part of. And I really got focused on what, what, what were the ones that I wanted to focus on? Cause I was spending way too much time mm. and then intentionally thinking about, okay, I'm going to have a meeting with this person. So intentionally thinking about what is it that I'm going to talk about? You know what I mean? So total, totally yeah. help my business. Yeah. Yeah. And I find that it helps with all the, like the intentionality of what kind of people do I want to work with, draw exactly. in, like mm -hmm. when you're, especially entrepreneurship, right? Like it's just, there's so much hustle to it just to keep up with what's happening and to deliver and plan and move yep. things forward. It's so easy to get into that place where you're like, Oh my God, what am I doing? <laughs> Right, right, totally. So the intentionality is a huge word and that totally is translated to my business because mm -hmm. I'm more intentional about who I hire. I'm more intentional about who we do business with. I'm more intentional about how I spend my time. So it's awesome. across the board. So would you say that's your favorite book or is there another one? No, it's Science of Getting Rich is my favorite book. <laughs> and it's so like, seriously audience go read that book it's amazing yeah <laughs> it works it works it works <laughs> and who's your favorite messenger oh good question um i would say right now i'm really high on lewis Howes. Mm. he has a podcast called school of greatness um he's a former professional athlete but every time i am in the car or listening to his podcast, I get value out of it. And he's extreme optimist, which I'm a total optimist. Um, so right now he's my favorite. Nice. Mm -hmm. I love, I love asking those questions because for me, it's just like building resources and how having people listen in and, you know, someone may never heard of these. Right. Right. Yeah. He's phenomenal. Yeah. Well, good. Well, I just want to thank you so much for being here today. And yeah, you're welcome. Your story and a ton of your expertise. I know that, um, man, your book is really, really powerful and it makes it so easy and palatable is a perfect word. Like I even have my son is 15 and he's like ready to make some money. And I'm like, what other 15 year old builds a resume? Right. But he has a ton of like work and project experience. He's done yeah. stuff for me, he's done stuff for some of my team members. Like, yeah. why not compile that and put it into Totally. I mean, who's not going to hire that 15 year old? So your book is sitting out on my dining room table because he's taking notes and making his own resume, right? Now. Awesome. I love it. Awesome. Why not give it to our kids too, right? Right. Exactly. Love it. So, well, I want to thank you again, and I, uh, I want to thank our listeners for joining us. I'd love to hear from you, love to hear um, what you're taking away from this, any ahas or oh yeahs that you, that you came away with today. And I also want to thank our sponsor, SiteChisel.com, who's offering a 10% discount to my listeners with the code MINDFUL10 on all the visual branding stuff. The website, amazing. So um, that's a wrap for today, and I look forward to the next time. Thanks, Renee. Thank you so much.